Great. Ah, so it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. Richard Day. He's professor in the Department of Second Language Studies at the University of Hawaii. His areas of specialization include second language reading, second language teacher education, curriculum design, and materials development. Dr. Day is the author of numerous pu publications, uh, particularly on second language reading. His publications include New Ways in Teaching Reading and Teaching Reading. Some of his most influential publications are on extensive reading. Professor Day is the co-author with Julian Bamford on ext extensive reading in the second language classroom, which helped draw wide attention to extensive reading. He later co-edited Extensive Reading Activities for Teaching Language, which is a collection of, of over 100 extensive reading activities. Professor Day is also the co-author of the textbook series, Impact Issues, books one through three, and cover to cover, books one through three. I'm sure many of you in this room are quite familiar with these publications. Dr. Day is, author co is also co-editor of the journal Reading in a Foreign Language and is one of the co-founders of the Extensive Reading Foundation. He's traveled extensively to conduct workshops and presentations on reading and teacher development. He's been a visiting professor at Ubon Rajathani University and Assumption University in Thailand, Hanoi University of Foreign Studies in Vietnam, and Asia University in Japan. Dr. Day is in constant demand as a speaker and has presented workshops in across much of Asia. So I think we're quite fortunate to have him here today. I would also like to mention that in 2019, he was honored by the University of Hawaii for 50 years of teaching and service, and he is still going strong. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Day. Over to you. Okay, good. I'm not over yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, have you done it, Anne? I can't. I, all I see is you at this point. I should be seeing myself. Not necessarily. You can change gallery view in the top left of your screen. Okay. Top right. From speaker yeah. view to top, gallery view. Top right. You want me to go to gallery top view right. or speaker view? Gallery. Gallery view. Okay, there's gallery view there. Okay, and I can see 147 people, right? Yes. yes. Everybody? Oh, yes. good. Now, thank you very much, Anne, for that uh, very nice introduction. It's just a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I would like to have been there in person, but uh, we're quarantined here like everybody else. Okay, now, uh, let me share my screen and go to my PowerPoint presentation here. Okay, and click on this one here. Okay, now uh, I hope everybody can see it. Um, I'm going to the title of, uh, of my talk is called Extensive Reading in Practice. And here's what I'll be doing. I'm going to first talk about the nature of extensive reading. And then I'm going to go over the 10 ER principles and then look at the practice of extensive reading. And uh, I hope then we will be done before the, my allotted time is up. Now, by the end of my uh, presentation, we will have gained insights into the history and nature of extensive reading, examined the practice of extensive reading, looked at how to put extensive reading into practice, and then speculated on some possible future directions of ER. And I'm hoping we have enough time to maybe go over some ER activities. So that's what we're going to be doing in the next uh, about 30 to 35 minutes. Let's go ahead and start. Now, the nature of extensive reading. Harold Palmer, I don't know if any of you remember his name, Harold Palmer. From what I could find out, he was probably the first one to actually use the term extensive reading as regards to foreign language teaching. Now, Palmer viewed it as, this is important, real world reading 
but for a pedagogic purpose. Now, isn't that interesting? Real world reading, but for a pedagogic purpose. Now, over the years, there are other terms that have been used for extensive reading. For example, supplementary reading, free voluntary reading, pleasure reading, sustained silent reading, book flood, independent reading, and drop everything and read, often abbreviated to dear. Now, these terms have been used for extensive reading, but what do they refer to? Okay. Now, actually, if we do any looking at extensive reading, there is no single practice of extensive reading. For example, one English as a foreign language program, which the uh, founders and the teachers called ER, was described this way, and this is an actual quote. The students read three chapter books over the course of five weeks. Students had to read each text carefully to understand the meaning of the story because they were required to take a detailed comprehension at the beginning of the following class. What do you think? Is this extensive reading? Hmm. Okay. Now, the nature of extensive reading. Now, I'm sure that all of you know about the, the 10 principles, but let me give you some background to them. My colleague, Julian Bamford, we analyze successful e extensive reading programs. We determined what factors made these different programs work well and then formulated them. And out of them came these uh, 10 principles. Now, Julian and I did this. Now, this is important to remember. We did this in the interest of professional development to encourage teachers to use the principles as a tool to examine their beliefs about reading in general and extensive reading in particular. Now, let me underline this idea that we did this in the interest of professional development to help teachers look at what they were doing and what their beliefs were. Now, let's go over very quickly the 10 principles. I won't spend a lot of time on them. The reading material is easy, variety of reading materials available. Learners, learners choose what they want to read. They read as much as possible. The purpose for their reading is usually related to pleasure, information, and general understanding. Reading is its own word. Reading speed or reading rate is usually faster rather than slower. Reading is individual and silent. Teachers orient and guide students. And the last one, the teacher is a role model. Now these, as I said earlier, came out of our examination of a number of successful extensive reading programs. Now, the 10 principles. Recall that these were formulated to encourage teachers to use them as a tool to examine their beliefs about the learning and learning of second language reading in general and extensive reading in particular. Now the B word, but they've been criticized and attacked. Uh, anyway, let's look at these in practice. Okay, um, about five years ago, I did a study about the use of the 10 principles. But before I do that, think about your own view of the 10 principles. Think for a minute. Which ones do you think are really, really important to use in a program that you call extensive reading? Okay, that is, which ones do you need to be able to use the term extensive reading? That is, what do you think is extensive reading? So I want you to take, I'll take a, maybe 30 seconds and let you think and then get these principles in your mind. And then I'll go over the findings of a study about how often they're used. Okay, now everybody's going to come up differently about what they think 
are important. Okay, now let's take a look at the results of this study that I did. Now, the, the, I looked at 44 extensive reading programs. Now, I will present the 10 principles with the number of times the principles were mentioned as being used in these 44 programs. Okay, so these are the 10 principles. And in the 44 programs, these how many often that they were actually used in the extensive reading program. Okay, now let's take a look at the top four. The first one, 38 of the programs said that they follow learners choose what they want to read. 36 said learners, you use learners read as much as possible a wide variety of reading material on a wide range of topics is available. That was used in 35 of the 44. And the fourth one, the reading material is easy, was used in 34 of the 44 programs. Okay, 38, 36, 35, and 34. Think about your top ones. Which ones did you choose? Are they similar? Okay, now, Let's look at these four and possibly try to figure out why they're so important. The first one, learners choose what they want to read. Why do you think this principle is so important that 38 of the 44 programs incorporated that into their extensive reading program? Okay, now, I think it's important for this reason. It gives the students the freedom to read material that they find interesting, that they like, okay? It's difficult for teachers to know what is easy for each student and to know what they would enjoy reading. So the autonomy is given to the students. Now this principle finds is tricky because some teachers will not do that. And it turns out, this is my thinking now, that some teachers teach because they like to be in charge. They like authority, they like the control, and they're not about to give it up to their students. Okay, now, related to this principle is that it gives students the choice, the freedom of stopping reading a book that they don't like or they find too hard. So this is super, to me, this is super important. Number four, this was the second one. Learners read as much as possible, why? How do we learn to read? Everybody think about this. How do we learn to read? Can you answer that question? There's only one way. Are you ready? Okay. We learn to read by reading. There's no other way. We don't have it part of our genetic code. Okay. We're born, if everything is all right, with the genetic ability to speak and listen, but not to read and write. So we have to do it. Okay. How do you learn to ride a bike? By riding the bike, by cooking, all these things we have to do. And the more our students read, the better readers they become. Okay. So important. Learners read as much as possible. Number two, this was the third one a wide range of reading material on a wide range of topics is available. This is just related to the two we just examined because if there's not a wide variety of material on a wide number of topics, students can't choose what they want to read and they don't have material that they won't read then and they've got to learn to read by reading. So this is really, really important, okay? And the last one, 
the reading material is easy. Why should what learners read be easy? Shouldn't it be hard and difficult? Well, if the readings are hard and not easy to understand, learners will not read much and will not enjoy reading in the new language. So they've got to be easy, okay? What is easy? This is tricky, what is easy, okay? Now, Steve Krashen said the best way to learn a new language is to have comprehensible input. By that he meant I is input is plus one. That means slightly beyond their proficiency level in the language, slightly above it. But I say to learn to read, it should be I minus one, slightly below the comprehensible level of proficiency in that. That would be easy. Now, the macho maxim of reading instruction, no reading pain, no reading gain. But ER reading motto, reading gain without reading pain. The reading material must be easy, easy. This is directly related to the top three. They choose, they read as much as possible, and a wide variety of reading material is available, okay? The reading material is easy. Good. Now, let's look at extensive reading in practice. Now, so what? What's the effect of extensive reading in English as a second language and English as a foreign language context? A colleague and I did a study a couple of years ago, a meta-analysis, then we wanted to answer that question. What's the effects of ER in ESL and EFL context? Our study gathered 70 unique samples from 49 primary studies published between 1980 and 2014, involving a total of almost 6,000 participants, 5,919 participants. The results showed the supremacy of extensive reading over a traditional reading approach experimental versus controlled contrast uh, and P to post contrast was 0.79. This is a significant difference. It showed that over a traditional approach to teaching reading, extensive reading really, really helped the students gain reading proficiency. This study clearly shows the positive impact of the practice of extensive reading. So when students engage in extensive reading, they learn to read. Exciting. Now, ER in practice. Now, there are a number, from my studies of extensive reading, there are a number of ways that ER is actually used. The first one is what I call a stand-alone course. That is, it's an extensive reading course. There's nothing else done in the course except engage in extensive reading. Uh, I've never done this, frankly, and I would love to do it before uh, I don't teach anymore, but I've never done this. Okay? But I've known people who have done it and they always enjoy it and the students learn a great deal. Another way is to take a course and put it aside and put extensive reading in. Okay? It replaces an existing course in the curriculum. Hmm. I've never done that either. I've, and I've heard of it being done, but I have never done it. I would, I, I, it would be, kind, it's kind of, it's a standalone course, but it's replacing an existing course in the, uh, pro, in the language program. The third way is an addition to an existing course. Okay? There's already a course, and it could be a reading course, a four skills course, whatever it is, but extensive reading is added to it, okay? Now, I've done this a number of times. In fact, this is the most common way of, uh, that I'm aware of, of ER in practice, in addition to an extensive course, okay? Now, ER is extra. The course remains the same. Note what it says an addition to an extensive reading course, not replacing part of an existing course, but it's extra. Everything else in the course remains the same. 
most of the reading that the students do for ER is done outside of the class, not inside, because the course is the same. They've got to cover the same material that the other course that's there is done. Some reading is done in class and credit is given for extensive reading. Now, the last time I did this was a couple of years ago. I did it in a second semester Japanese course at the University of Hawaii, okay? Second semester, that is the students had one semester in the fall of Japanese, it was called Japanese 101. And then in the second semester, Japanese 102, we added extensive reading to it, okay? Nothing was left out. And what we did was say, we gave the extensive reading 15% of the final grade. That is, so 15 points of extensive reading were in the final grade. And if the students <clears throat> read a certain number of books, they got 15. If they read a slightly less number, they got 14, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we gave credit for extensive reading. Okay? Now, extensive reading activities may be done in class to monitor students' reading and to enhance incidental language learning. We'll talk about ER activities uh, in another minute or two. Now, this I find very, very helpful because if, if you do extensive reading in class and, the, and you do activities and the students have not done the reading, then they can't engage in the activities. So it's a very, very nice way of monitoring the students' reading, okay? Now, when I do, uh, when I've done this, I always introduce extensive reading at the beginning of the class, before students do anything. And I give them three rules. Now, I'm gonna give you the three rules and I need your help. And you can, we can talk about this in the Q&A session at the end of my presentation. I get a little bit concerned about the difference between my first rule and my second rule. I'm not sure which one is more important than the other. So let me know which one is more important for you, the first one or the second one. Okay, here are the three rules that I give my students at the beginning of the ER. Are you ready? Here's rule number one. Okay, now here is rule number two. Now you know rule number three already, right? E N J J O Y. Now, uh, about uh, a number of years ago, I was teaching at um, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, excuse me, uh, uh, Hanoi. I was teaching this one, I was in Hanoi. And we, it was, I added ER to a class and I presented these rules. And I had a class of uh, third year English majors. Three years later, I was back in uh, Hanoi for a plenary conference. And at the end of the conference, I was talking to some of the people in the audience and one of my former students came up to see me. And he had a big smile on his face and he said, good afternoon, Dr. Enjoy. So he really remembered the rules. Okay, ER in practice, remember we have a standalone course, replacement course in addition to an extensive existing course, an extracurricular activity, that is for example, an after school club. Now I did this in Japan and it was really nice. We did it on a Saturday morning. We met every Saturday morning and engaged in extensive reading. And at the end of the semester, we had an extensive reading marathon. And for the two hours, we, we, said how, we saw how many books each of the students could read. And the student that read the most, we took him to lunch. It was quite exciting. It really, really worked well. Now, during the homeroom period. Now, I'm, I, I, the reason I'm telling you about this during the homeroom period is that I'll share with you a true story. A number of years ago, I was giving a, a, a workshop on extensive reading to English language teachers in Seoul, Korea. 
and uh, talked about this. Now, one of, uh, I was back a couple years later and gave another workshop on extensive reading. And at the end of the talk, one of the teachers who had been to my first workshop two years before came up to tell me that she was so sold on extensive reading that she put it into her homeroom in her middle school. Okay? She was teaching English at a middle school in, a, uh, in De, uh, Tegu, uh, Korea. And every half hour from 8.30 to 9 o'clock, the students had to read books. That's all they could do. Now, she didn't have any, any extensive reading books. Uh, so what she did was, using her own money, bought a whole bunch of graded readers and used them. Now, the students liked it so much, a couple of them started to take the books home and were reading them at home. Now, this is a story that the teacher told me. Now, one of the girls was reading at home and her mother came up to her and said, what are you doing? Oh, she said, I'm reading an English book. And the mother was very surprised. You're reading an English book? Oh, yes, said the student, her, son, her daughter. I really love it. Now, in the neighborhood, there was a neighbor and this neighbor had a, 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 a daughter who was in the same grade, but not the same homeroom as this student. And the mother knew that. So when she saw that girl's mother one morning, she said to her, my daughter reads English books at home. Does yours? <laughs> the mother got so upset, she went to this principal of the middle school and wanted to know what was going on and was very upset. Well, of course, the principal couldn't say anything because he had no idea what the teacher was doing. So he went to her homeroom and saw what the students were doing. And he asked the students about it and they told him they enjoyed it. He was so impressed that he bought books for the whole school, all three grades in the middle school, and everybody did it at homeroom. And the teacher got her money back. Quite a nice experience. Okay. Now, let's look ahead. This is my prediction about the practice of extensive reading. I believe that we're going to see more combinations of what I call intensive or traditional reading and extensive reading, a combination where extensive reading and the traditional approaches are used in the same thing, in the same classroom, sharing, okay? Now, I also think that there will be supervised extensive reading, okay? That is, this doesn't necessarily take place in a classroom, but a teacher could be high, supervising independently some students who want to do extensive reading. And I call that supervised extensive reading. Now, this is already happening. Students are reading extensive reading on their own. They're just doing it because for some reason, however they do it, they find out about it. Now, this semester at the University of Hawaii, I'm teaching a first semester course to my MA students, my master's students. And one of the students told me that she's Japanese, and she told me that she really learned English because <clears throat> she started to read books. Her sister had, and had an extensive reading uh, program at her school and gave the books to her sister. And she started reading them on her own, and she really, really enjoyed it. So I think that there is this practice of independent extensive reading, and I think it's going to become more widespread. Okay, now also looking ahead, the internet is becoming prominent and it will be becoming more and more prominent. Mobile devices, our phones will be major players. Now, whatever form it takes, these different practices, extensive reading is going to continue to spread around the globe. And I, this is a prediction, I think it's going to be used in more languages other than English. That is right now, English is the, is the language that's used most commonly in ER, but I think it's going to be used more and more and more. For example, there are already extensive readers, uh, extensive uh, readers in Chinese. Okay? I think that's going to become more and more prominent. Now, remember number six, reading is its own reward. Okay? Now, there's a but there because there are activities that are possible and there are actually quizzes that you can do. 
Now, Tom Robb, who uh, talked just before this, talked about the Moodle Reader, and this is a uh, browser-based tool that provides quizzes on over 5,500 graded readers and books so that teachers can have a simple way to assess their students' work. Okay? Uh, and also, there's the X Reading, Tom Goldman stuff, Tom uh, X Reading program, which has a whole bunch of graded readers and follow-up quizzes. I've used this extensive reading program and I highly recommend it, definitely. Now, also, I think we ought to take a quick look at activities, ER and practice. Let me take a quick look at the time. Okay, we've got enough time for a few activities before I turn it over to Q&A. Now, ER in practice, some activities, extensive reading activities. Now, by this, these are activities that you can actually do before, during or after students have read their books, their graded readers. Now, uh, I've, these are things that I have done. Uh, we know from research that there is what, what we call incidental vocabulary acquisition. That is when students engage in extensive reading, they increase their vocabularies without direct study. But, the research shows the gains are fairly small. So what I have done in my teaching of ER is added vocabulary journals. That is, when students have finished reading a book, I tell them to go look through the book and pick out some words that they didn't know before or that have different meanings they didn't know and put them in their journal. And then what they do is send me their journals every now and then, and I look at them and then return them. Then maybe the, about the third or fourth week of doing journals, I have what I call group discussions. I tell each student to bring to class three or four new words that they've learned from their reading. And they get in groups of three or four and share their new words. Now, it's interesting because I get reports from the students that they may learn words from their colleagues, from their classmates, okay? Then I do self-tests. Now, this is, takes some time. The other two activities don't take much time at all from teachers, but the self-tests take a little bit of time. And let me explain a self-test. What I do is I spend about a half an hour and I give the students examples of how to test for vocabulary, translation, matching, fill in the blanks, you know how to do that. And I have them then make a test, 20 items on the test of the last three weeks that they have been reading from their journals. And then they send me by email their tests. I go over my students' tests, maybe I would correct them, I might uh, change the order, etc. And then on the day of the test in class, I have hard copies of each student's test and I give each student his or her own self-test. They take the test and give it back. Now guess what score they get? Generally, it's 100%. Isn't that interesting? Now, they don't learn the words by taking the test, but in making the test. Really interesting. I've got a lot of very positive feedback to self-tests. Oral fluency, listening and speaking, okay? Now, uh, let me see, I've got a little bit of time here. This is really fun. Three, two, one, okay? Let's look at three, two, one. In three, two, one, what I do is tell my students that they will have uh, three minutes to share their favorite book with a classmate. So, they, so we talk about in class before the assignment, what would you tell your classmate about a book you're reading? And we brainstorm, we come up, what's the title, what's the author, what's the setting, who are the main characters, what's the plot, et cetera. And I have to caution them, don't give away the end, okay? So I say, get ready, come to class uh, in, uh, two, in the next meeting and be prepared to share your favorite book, three, two, one, with your classmate. So they come and I put them in pairs. I go A, B, A, B, A, B. And then all the A's are with a B. And then the A's have three minutes to share. And I count down, two, one, stop. And then 
the B, their partner, asks some questions, and then it's B's turn to do the same thing, share his or her book with A, the partner. And they do that for three minutes and then ask questions. Then what I do is I have all the A's stand up and find the new B. And they do the same thing for two minutes, first A, then B. And after that, they stand up again and get a new partner for one minute. Now, here's the problem with this activity. Well, it's a great activity because there's no teacher preparation. Super keen, so it's a five star. The problem is getting the students to stop talking. At the end of two minutes or at the end of one minute, they haven't finished sharing their story. How often do you have a problem getting your students to stop talking? Okay, three, two, one. Really good, okay, good. This is a report of it right there. You have it on the slide, okay? And they do it for one more minute. Three, two, one, good. My favorite passage, this is straightforward. After reading a book, students select the passage uh, from a book that they like. And then what they do is share it at home. I mean, read it at home themselves and then come and share with a partner in class and read their favorite passage, okay? Now, for example, I'm going to read you very quickly my passage from a book that I really, really like, and I'm going to share it with you. This book is called Jojo's Story. Okay, it's a book about a young boy who lives in a country and there's a civil war. And he comes home from school and he finds that everybody, this, the enemy has come to his village and killed everybody. And here's how the book begins. Chapter one, only me, Jojo. It's dark again, so it's evening. No, I'm, I'm wrong. It's, it's, it's the, I think the fourth evening, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yes, it's Thursday. Why do I count the days? Why do I say it's Thursday? There aren't any more days. There's just time. Time when it's dark and time when it's light. Everything is dead, so why not days too? Yes, no more days, no more Thursdays. There's only now. And there's only me. Why? Why aren't I dead too? My favorite passage. Now, I've discovered that what happens is when they read it to their classmates, they want, their classmate wants to read the book. It's quite exciting, okay? and explain why they like it. Well, this hooked me. I had to continue reading the book. I couldn't put it down. Sentence detective, this is grammar, this is cool. Now, I took a, 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 a sentence from a book and I added one word. Okay, so you are the sentence detective and you look at my sentence and figure out which word did I add? And here's the answer. The distinguished professor walked confidently into the crowded classroom. So I added older, okay? Now, when I have my students do it, I tell them, for example, add an adjective, add an adverb, et cetera. And then they try to do it. This is fun. The students really enjoy this. They try to trick their classmates, okay? Now, I know what comes next. John, look, Mary, at my new bicycle. This came from a graded reader. Mary said, that's really great. Where did you get it? And John said, my dad gave it to me and then your partner would have to fill in the blank. I know what comes next. And I think all of you can answer this one. Try it. John, my dad gave it to me for my birthday. Good, okay, You're a, you know what comes next. Now, here's the last activity and it's really good. After reading a book, Students select a gift for each of the main characters in the book. They write a paragraph about each gift, explaining why they selected the gift. Excuse me, why they selected the gift. Then they get in, in class, they get in small groups with the same people that have read the same book and share their gifts. It's really interesting you will be surprised how creative your students can be. And there is no teacher preparation for this. Now, 
I'd like to share with you, I'd like to share with you, I'm going to uh, tr uh, stop sharing for a minute, and I'm going to show you this book. It's uh, Jojo's Story. Okay, this was the book that was my favorite passage. Now, Jojo is one of the main characters in this book. Now, when I was teaching in Hanoi, extensive reading, member, I had a student call me Dr. Enjoy. I had one of the students, a female student, she was about 21 years old, they were second, third year students, English majors. She read Jojo's story and she said that she told about the gift that she would give Jojo. Now think for a minute, what gift would you give Jojo? Remember he came home, found everybody, everything in his village was gone, destroyed, killed. He was alone. What would you give Jojo? Now, I will never forget what this young student wrote. It stays with me because I really learned from it. Here's what she said. She said, I will give Jojo love. He has no one to love and no one to love him. We all need love. There's too much hate and violence in today's world. Powerful, isn't it? Really powerful. Okay. Ooh, I don't know what happened here. Okay, I'm going down to here. Okay, and here's where we were. Okay, the gift. Now, the outcomes. We will have gained insights into the history and nature of extensive reading. Examine the practice of extensive reading looked at how to put ER in practice, speculated on some possible future directions, and went over a few activities for extensive reading. Now, here's some references for you. Okay. And the last one here was the one on the meta-analysis on the effectiveness of it. Okay, here's my conclusion. Come on. I'm trying to get out of screen sharing here. I'm not, it's not letting me go. There we go. Okay. Back to Anne. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a bit of time for some questions, um, but I was also looking at the chat while um, you were speaking. And there's some really interesting uh, comments here. And uh, I'll just, um, some, some people were answering the questions as they were reading the chat, but I'll pose them right. to you as well, okay? Okay. 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 Um, some of my students challenged themselves by choosing the I plus one yes. book. Yes. In our year. Yeah. How should a teacher see such phenomena? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, I, can, I can give you an answer that I have used. I was teaching ER, remember I was saying I had this um, uh, Saturday morning after school extensive reading club. I had one student who was reading at like a um, sort of a level two if you can, you know, not level one, but right above that. And she read a, a mystery story. And she really liked it and wanted to read another book by that author, but it was at a higher level. So she came to see me and said, what should I do? Well, I said, okay, give it a try. And if, if it's too hard, stop. But if you can get by, keep going. So about a week later, she came back with a big smile on her face, holding the book and waving it. She said, sensei, sensei, I did it. It was a bit difficult but I really enjoyed it. So I think it depends, I guess, to really address the question, it depends upon the circumstance. So I would not say no. I would figure out the student, the interest, 
and go from there. Yeah, if I could just add to that as well, I've had students who um, are reading at quite a low level, yes. but they, uh, for example, uh, they, they like to read uh, English magazines um, mm -hmm. on, you know, cooking or fashion magazines, and the level is quite high for them because yes. it's, right, but they're interested in fashion. Or they're yeah. interested in cooking, so they'll go through it, even though it's difficult, even though the vocabulary mm -hmm. might be challenging, they still enjoy the content, so mm -hmm. they will read it anyway. And you don't even have to um, suggest it, they just start doing it. Good. You know? Good. Yeah. yeah. You think it helps them by doing that? Yes, I do. I think um, anything, uh, if they're interested in the content, you know, I think they will work through it. Yes. Uh, because they want to know. Good, good. Yeah. I agree with you. I like that example. I, can I use that later in some talks I give? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Another question. Uh, the rule to enjoy is tough to get across to unmotivated students. <laughs> some see no future need to learn to read in English. How can we change motivation so they do enjoy? and later ultimately improve their ability? Yeah, that's, that's another very good question. Um, we know from research that there are a number of different L1 reading behaviors that influence learning to read in a second language. Okay? Research is clear, I won't go into the details here. But one of these is the affective variable, attitude and motivation. In other words, generally speaking, if you enjoy reading in your first language and have a positive attitude and high motivation, that may, not 100%, carry into learning in the L2, learning to read. It's possible, okay? Now, in the L2 reading, if they are reading books that they like, that they enjoy, and that are easy to read and interesting, then, they may have a strong motivation and a positive attitude towards reading in that. Now, there's something else that's happened that, through my own research that I found. And this has come about from teaching uh, in Thailand and in Japan, both. What I have had is students who are, have, are doing extensive reading in English and really, really enjoy it. They have high motivation and positive attitudes, but they don't read in their L1 at all. They don't like it, they never read, but all of a sudden they discovered they like it in English. So guess what's happened? They transfer this positive excitement and enjoyment from the L2 English to their L1, for example, Thailand, and begin reading for pleasure in Thai. And I call that uh, the foreign language reading reverse transfer. Foreign language reading reverse transfer. Right. Yes, I think we've seen that quite often, you know. Yes. In my experience as well, I've seen that. Um, yeah. Um, a couple of other questions that are just kind of popping up and um, I can open it up to the floor in a minute, but I think some of these questions, I get to curate the questions. <laughs> so, so what do you think is the best way for the teacher to be an ER role model? For example, reading L1 novels, uh, reading graded readers, reading L2 books, talking about what they read. What's the good way to be a role model? Uh, that's great. Okay, good, good. Now, um, this is, this is really nice. Remember, remember when I was talking about teaching uh, Japanese, second semester Japanese uh, 102 at UH, at University of Hawaii? Um, when we would do some reading in class, not often, but sometimes we, would, we could read maybe the first five minutes or the first 10 minutes in, uh, in uh, Japanese, I would do the same because I was learning Japanese just like they were learning Japanese. 
So I was reading Japanese. Now, I had a co-teacher, the, actually the real teacher of the class. Uh, uh, her name is uh, um, Hitsasugi. And she was reading in Italian because she was taking Italian. So she was doing reading, learning to read in Italian. And we were the role models. Right. Um, yes, I think that's, that's quite true. Um, we had a teacher that was teaching extensive reading. He's a native speaker of English. And in extensive reading classes, he would read Jap Japanese graded readers. You know, to be that role yeah. model. Yeah. You know, you know, what I think is so important is that students, after they finished school or a semester or whatnot, years later, they don't remember what you taught them, unfortunately, but they remember you, the teacher. They remember what you did and how you acted and how you taught. And if you're a role model, it's going to have a major impact on your students. Yeah, true. Right. Okay, um, before I open it up to questions from Let's the floor. Pause. Can I just follow up on that? Yes. yes. Um, my, I'm an, I'm a, um, my native language is English. So if I'm reading in the, I can't, how do I be a role model? Is it better for me to read the same books that the students are reading, do you think? Should I be reading a Japanese book? Should I be like reading a French book or? <laughs> Mark, good question. I was reading the same books that my students were reading in Japanese. Right. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So, so I would say if you can, if you're at that level and they, they, you can benefit from them, yes, good, good. Now, the interesting thing, Mark, as long as I'm talking about this Japanese uh, extensive reading class, we didn't have really any extensive, Japanese extensive uh, graded readers. We didn't have them. So what we had to use was children's literature in Japanese. It was very interesting. And some of the stuff was actually translated from English. So they would be reading Japanese stories based, translated from uh, English. And some of them were reading stories that they remember as reading as kids. And it was quite exciting because they didn't have to worry about the plot or story or understanding, but, but they were getting the vocab, the grammar, et cetera. Yeah. And how about you? Sorry? How about you, Anne? Have you, what, what would you think? About role models? No, about what, what Mark was asking about. What should the, yeah, what should the teacher be reading? I think it depends on the teacher. Um, I think uh, because if uh, you're a native Japanese teacher teaching re extensive reading, maybe the book that the students are reading would be good. Okay, yeah. but if you're a native teacher of English in an extensive reading class, then you as a learner um, might be reading Japanese or another language, you're another L2. Uh, yeah, easy another. stuff, really easy, yes. um, graded um, readers, if they're available. Uh, yes. And that's what one of our teachers did. He was studying Japanese. And so an extensive reading class, while the students are reading their English books, he would read Japanese, um, you know, simple storybooks for children, really easy books uh, for children, uh, right. all written in hiragana. And, uh, you know, that's what he did because he wanted to be right. the right role model. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Can I make an observation? Yeah. If you don't sure. mind. Um, I, I think it's important if you're going to be reading in class with the students that they know what you're doing and why. Yes. Same also with the other teachers and the administration. Because if the administration's walking past and see you reading the book, they may just think you're being lazy. So <laughs> you have to be careful of that. I heard Good. of someone who nearly lost their job because of that. So we have to be quite yeah. careful. Everybody understands. Good. Good. Good point. Thank you. Yeah. There are a couple of comments about what about grading, grading the extensive reading uh, assessment. Uh, well, uh, I think as I mentioned, when we added it to the Japanese class, we gave them credit for for a number of books read. Okay, and we didn't use quizzes. Now, um, sometimes people will use quizzes and do it, 
and find out how that works, either through the M reader or the uh, or the other ones. So it's possible. Yep. I'm not a big fan of testing myself. I had a very interesting experience. Uh, uh, we, we used the extensive reading in Japanese uh, the second uh, semester a couple of times. And one of the times we used it, we had a bunch of of students from China whose first language was Chinese. And they were then learning to read in Japanese. They were taking Japanese and they found it very easy. But what they did was they stayed at levels one and levels two so they could read a lot of books and get a lot of credit. <laughs> so I had to say, you know, if you have to read so many at this level and so many at this level. It was very clever because I couldn't get over how many books they were reading. And then I figured it out. Right. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because um, there was one comment on the chat uh, who said, the person said that even motivated students who want to read, uh, yes. they tend to lag if there wasn't a grade attached to it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's an interesting comment. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Anybody else? Does somebody want to comment from the floor? We have 154 people here. I don't know how I'm going to manage that, but... Uh, Asuko's got her hand okay. raised. Yeah. Hi, uh, uh, hello. Yeah. What are you doing? Oh, I would like to talk about, uh, I would like to tell about the reverse from uh, English uh, reading to Japanese reading. Right. Okay. My librarian in high school reported to me that the more students were reading English books, the more English books they read, they started to check out Japanese books as well. <laughs> and reverse. also the teacher, English teacher at university, my former colleague said she didn't like uh, reading in Japanese, but after she did extensive reading in class and she started to read in Japanese too. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so they enjoyed reading itself, whether right. Jap English or Japanese. So right. I do believe that reverse <laughs> influences. <Right>. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Atsuko. Arigatou Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I think we just have one minute before we finish up. Um, really? Yes. Wise when you're having fun. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us from Hawaii. It's about five o'clock, five p.m. there, I think. Yes, it is Friday afternoon. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, thank you for joining us. I want I'd like everybody to give Dr. Day a nice round of applause and thank him for joining us. And thank you. It's been thank a real you. pleasure. I really wish I could have been there in person, but you know, we're struggling new things to do. Okay, everybody, enjoy the rest of the conference. I saw the list of speakers and everything, and it's just super what you've done organizing this. I, it's just terrific. Okay, good. Yes, we hope oh, to see you again wow. soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>